Hi, I'm David Mancy, and welcome to a new episode of the Today in Manufacturing podcast. With me today are Jeff Ranke and Anna Wells. We each have more than 15 years of experience covering the manufacturing industry. Every week, we cover the five most popular stories on our websites and discuss the implications they might have on the industry moving forward. Before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by giving us a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to reach the podcast, you can reach us at Jeff, David, or Anna at IN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. Big week, you guys. Big week, you guys. Anna, how are you feeling about it? Feeling good. Tim 52, today in Manufacturing 52. It's been a year, Jeff. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. What a roller coaster. And... It, in just a short 52 weeks, we have a first. We have our first sponsor of the podcast. Sweet. So I hear that like one podcast or sponsored, you got to like read the ad. So you got to do something. Yeah, Say I gotta, something. I got to do that. I'm going to jump right in. All right. Here All we right. go. Here we go. To the guys paying. <clears throat> Oil eater cleaners and heavy-duty degreaser were specifically designed to replace dangerous solvents and are used by industries throughout the world. The company's ultra-concentrated formulas are perfect for light, medium, or heavy cleaning and can be used with part washers, shop floors, equipment, and more. You can click the link below for a free sample or you can visit IEN.com backslash oil eater to register for a free sample. I mean... Hey, we're giving away something free, too. Yeah, that's not bad. I how how what, was it? I wonder what the more is. Yeah, I'm, I was actually interested in that, too. Can I get more information on your more? I actually use this stuff. It is really good. Yeah. yeah. It works really well around the house. Yeah, good and stuff. That's legitimate. That's not canned. I didn't even tell you there was a sponsor yet. No, no. I just, um, yeah, Rick sent us some stuff and definitely have used that around the garage. Nice. Well. Nice. All right. Well, I'll have to sign up. Okay, let's jump into our first story this week. Amazon drone engineer told to work more despite burnout. Patrick Maga is a former Amazon drone engineer. The engineer worked in the company's drone program from late 2019 to April 2021. In February 2021, his manager said Maga was considered, quote, a low performer by Amazon's employee evaluation system. When he asked why, Amazon managers provided no details. Maga was placed in the company's, quote, pivot program, where he had the option to agree to a 30-day performance plan or accept severance. Maga was struggling balancing home life as well as being a parent of two children, as well as his work life. When he told his manager, his manager told him to, quote, try to get more hours out of the day. The manager suggested that he work an average day, squeeze in a one-hour nap from 9 p.m. to 10 p.m., and then continue to work as late as 1 or 2 in the morning. Maga quit a few days later and is now working with Washington state lawmakers to pass legislation that would require employers to provide information regarding worker performance reviews in personnel files. Now, according to Maga, Amazon doesn't consider performance reviews as part of your personnel file. Now, Jeff, there's a couple of issues here. Everything from the work-life balance, particularly during a pandemic, to what information employees have access to. Yeah, there is a lot to potentially unpack here. I guess the first thing that stood out to me was this individual manager and sort of the route that he or she took in dealing with Mr. McGaw here, with Patrick McGaw. Now, it seems to me like this kind of seems relevant relative to a publishing company that we all actually used to work for. Mm -hmm. It was a bigger company, but it was broken down into groups or brands, basically. Yeah. And really the culture of you of my work life really was more dependent on that group that I worked in as opposed to the overall corporate entity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. what it came down to is that manager, and there was some that were very good, there were some that were bad throughout the company, they were either focused on their people or the end result, mm -hmm. their budget, hitting a number, what's the output here? That seemed to be what really drove them on. They were all accountable in the same way we all were in terms of what we were delivering and what we were producing. But for some, there was definitely more of an appreciation for the individuals involved. And the most successful groups that I worked with understood sort of collaboration on both fronts, understood mm -hmm. it took both. Obviously, you want to be successful, hit your numbers, do what you need to, to, pr to produce what you're supposed to, but you also have to take care of your people. Mm -hmm. It also made me think a lot of, you know, we brought this up before in the military, mission first, people always. Mm -hmm. And in this instance, this manager was really given, you just have to think it was really, he's been producing. 
Amazon sort of leaving him alone to manage his people and do what works for him. Mm -hmm. This approach that he tried to pass along to Patrick here, this is what worked for that individual. Now, it doesn't look like it would work for a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he's definitely open for criticism there. But again, is Amazon focused on a culture that is Amazon? Or is it really more these individual segments of their business and how those individual managers choose to go about managing their employees? And I think it's a really difficult line to walk or a really difficult balance to find because you do, if this guy is turning out, uh, meeting his goals and hitting what he needs to for Amazon's drone division, they're not going to really mess with him too much. Yeah. They're right. going to let him do what he's going to do. And unfortunately, it probably impacts a lot of quality employees like this. And now when we start talking about skills gap, worker shortages, how is this going to play out long term? It's mm -hmm. great if this individual is finding this approach, this strategy to employee management working now. Mm -hmm. Is this a long term gain? And when you're working for a company that's so forward or so public facing as Amazon is right now, man, you are just open to scrutiny on a whole bunch of fronts. And they really left themselves open to looking kind of bad here. And you would think that would impact some of their recruitment efforts. Yeah. Then again, maybe some people look at this and are like, yeah, that's what I would do. Yeah. Something's got to get done. If I got to take a nap and work, hit it again at midnight, that's what I'm going to do. What's unfortunate here is I think it's another situation where this manager was not looking at the individual, sort of taking a collective approach <clears throat> as opposed to understanding this individual, what you're saying, this would not work here. Yeah. Like, I understand you want to be equal with everybody that you're managing, but you also have to be different yeah. to get the most out of everybody. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of it because I think that he was designated a low performer is a big part of it and that he wanted to know why. Uh, Anna, straight, straight shooter on the website, he said, you know, why is this newsworthy? Employees get poor performance reviews and leave the companies all the time. It happens every day. I mean, I think part of that, part of the story is just that, you know, maybe it just wasn't working out for both. Maybe, but I think it also reflects sort of an insensitivity to the circumstances from this manager, but also maybe is reflective of Amazon's inability to sort of rein in um, from a corporate standpoint what some of its divisions are doing. I mean, it particularly made me angry because the timing of it, it was, you know, it was February of 2021. We were still pre-vaccine pretty much. Um, my daughter's public school was still remote only. Like mm -hmm. I was working from home every day in a very disjointed way. Um, yeah. I had three kids at home. I was getting in the hours when I could, which often meant like late night getting caught up. Um, and I was definitely feeling burned out. And I know a lot of other parents were going through that exact same thing. And it was survivable for me, I think, because we mm -hmm. um, have an employer who acknowledged the realities of the situation and was basically having a lot of patience with our need for flexibility and like recognizing the fact that nobody was choosing these circumstances. Yeah. Like nobody wanted to be working under this kind of dress. It was really difficult for parents, right? And I know that Amazon gets a bad rap for how they manage their employees. We've seen it from the warehouse side, a mm -hmm. lot of conflict there. We've seen it from the delivery side. Um, you know, now obviously it's impacting white collar workers as well. And in this case, it is hard to determine if it was just this sort of rogue manager. And if he was just trying to be helpful, right? Yeah, to yeah. say like, here's what's working for me. True, like you can say anything to somebody that's burnt out and no matter <laughs> what you say to them, they're just gonna be like, I'm out, yeah. you know? Right, and I think like, <laughs> despite it being well-meaning potentially, like he's already being reprimanded in the sense that like he's being told that he's a poor performer. Yeah. And then I feel like the, the helpful, uh, you know, advice doesn't really like bring into the discussion that like this was completely unprecedented and unsustainable for working parents to be like working in these circumstances. Mm -hmm. So either way though, I think it does reflect poorly on Amazon and yeah. I'm honestly yeah. kind of tired of seeing Amazon pass the buck on this stuff because they do every time they say like it was this individual's choice. They, this was not our right. protocol. And at some point I think that companies like this need to rein in their managers and it's, and it's a training issue yeah. or it's an issue of people needing to be like effectively understanding what the company's standard operating procedures are mm -hmm. because it was February of 2021. We were in this pandemic for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. They should have, he should have had a better way of, of sort of, I don't know, coming to a solution here, in my opinion, you know, I, it's just not, I feel like some of these managers become managers because they've been there the longest, they're the most productive or whatever. They're not always necessarily the best at managing people like Jeff brought up, you know, mm 
Mm -hmm. they need to be in a very structured training environment before they're put in those roles. And I don't know how it is at Amazon, but you see this stuff come up again and again with a lot of corporations. Yeah. And I think Amazon has a role if they care. If they care. If they really do care about this, because Mm -hmm. again, it feels like this individual's approach is almost being rewarded because he's hitting his deadlines. He's whatever his mark is, whatever the goals are for that individual to hit, he's hitting them. Leave them alone. Yeah. And going back to that publishing company I referenced, there were plenty of people miserable at that place. I was in a great place working with good people because yeah. they took care of me and understood the bigger picture. This individual is just hitting his marks. Don't leave them well, alone. And part of what was successful, what breeds a successful culture is asking, you know, if the manager just told him, this is what works for me, it should work for you. Part of it is asking what do you think will work for you? Mm -hmm. How can I help you? You know, especially in a pandemic, that was a big reason that it worked for us, Anna, is, you know, we had a a good line of communication in terms of like, I can't do anything today. I have two kids that are sick and I'm not going to hit anything I need. You know, we're Mm -hmm. willing to ask for help in knowing that it was available to us. Mm -hmm. Whereas this just seemed like a straight uh, black or white scenario. You either got to do this or you got to go. One of the things that I don't like about this is the quote, pivot program. So when did HR transition, you know, to start getting cute, you know, like in real nice, you know, like the pivot program, he just was put on probation, right? You don't like, that's just it. You're going into our pivot program. Okay, Pat. And it's just like, I mean, just say you're on probation. Like, and you want to call it three strikes. Yeah. You're on your second strike here. You know, it's just, uh, I I don't know. Sometimes when it's uh, stuff like that, if I'm in that scenario, and I'm already angry because I received a uh, bad review or my kite is in the wrong quadrant, um, <laughs> uh, which is referencing a uh, yeah, yeah. a review software that we had used in a previous life where uh, you gave people <laughs> points and it created their uh, work kite. And then based on which quadrant this kite was flying, the person was either an A, B, C, D, or E, or F employee. But you could only have like two A's. Yeah, yeah you yeah. could only have two A's. Yeah. You, could no, only you couldn't have, have too many A's. That yeah, was, the kites yeah. could only fly so high. Right. There's power lines up there. You're going <clears> to... <throat> well, in talking about Amazon struggles, like in June 2021, Amazon was worried that it was actually burning through hourly workers so quickly that they were going to run out of people. Mm-hmm. That's like, I mean... I, in the world. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Like, yeah, we're going to... Where, where are we going to run out of people? Everywhere. Yeah. Just period. And then, like, also, the market for engineers is getting more and more competitive. Yeah. According to the U.S. labor statistics, the shortage of engineers in the U.S. is going to exceed 1.2 million in 2026. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if it's not working out, I mean, especially in drones, if you're a drone engineer, probably can get work anywhere right now. But, uh, and it's a, you know, it's a competitive market. Maybe go out there and find somebody that'll appreciate you. Mm-hmm. Well, I'd ask this and I'd ask those listening, watching this too. Is this guy at Amazon based on what we know? Is he a good manager? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is he? Because in this instance, according to his parameters, yeah. this person was a poor performer. Okay. Yeah. They couldn't keep up. So is a good manager somebody who gets rid of that because it's not hitting your expectations in terms of doing what you're doing? Or is he a bad manager because he didn't try to reach out to this individual and help him more. Well, we I, don't know. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, no, no. I was going to say just from Amazon, Amazon's yeah. perspective, he's probably a good manager right. because mm-hmm. he's not in the pivot program. He was a low performer and he's gone. And so yeah. technically that's a good manager kind of getting him out without draining any other resources. When you're looking at it at a more HR friendly pivot program, cute, you know, I wouldn't even say that, but yeah, no, like, saying. uh, if you're looking at it from the worker standpoint, you want to try and give them the best opportunity to succeed, succeed. And it doesn't sound to me like the manager was doing that. No. And I think like, was this person a permanently poor performer or was this person a poor performer uh, as a victim of these circumstances? Like, True. Yeah. You have to think about that. And like, I feel like by February of 2021, the largest private employer in the United States would have a handle on better trying to manage some of these people that are just really like hanging on barely, you know? I mean, that's part of it. He started in late 2019. Mm -hmm. So like he was a complete, he was a complete like pandemic employee. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's gotta be an interesting point. Like there are probably companies out there that don't really know what their employees look like in a normal world, in a a normal setting. Wow. That's crazy. All right. Let's talk about bullets. No, (laughs) or the lack thereof. All right, our next most popular story, 
documentary looks at the man behind the modern bulletproof vest. In 1969, Richard Davis was a bankrupt pizzeria owner living in Michigan when he got the idea for a bulletproof vest. Body armor wasn't new, but Davis thought he could make something lighter that could be worn under clothes. He started working with Kevlar, and to prove that his invention worked, he shot himself nearly 200 times. Davis is the subject of a new film, Second Chance, with the number two, which talks about Davis and his company, Second Chance, which is spelt out. It's cute that way. It also covers one of the company's biggest failures, when a police officer died after the company started using Xylon in its vest. Now, Jeff, did you see any of the footage of this man? It's out there, and he is a character. Yeah, extremely interesting guy. I mean, he does have quite a story. I mean, they they brush on it briefly here, but he was a he owned three different pizzerias. Mm -hmm. He was delivering pizzas one night in Detroit, Michigan, Mm -hmm. and he got jumped. But he was carrying a weapon and basically took down two of these guys. A third one ran off. Holy cow! I mean, he was involved in this, and while he was recovering because he did get shot after getting jacked for pizzas, basically, um, that's where all of this came from about trying to develop a bulletproof vest for law enforcement that sees these types of situations all the time. Yeah. So very interesting guy. I thought one of the quotes that was kind of cool too, that he said about shooting himself to test the validity of the bulletproof vest. He said the first time it was for science, the others were show business. Oh yeah. And it kind of helps illustrate the fact that it's one thing to come up with a great idea. You got to be able to sell it Mm -hmm. and you have to be able to put it out there. And that's what he was able to do. Now he's a little over the top. Okay. With some things, Going beyond that initial um, getting and grinding acceptance from from those he was trying to sell these uh, bulletproof vests to, but his technology was good. Then he got into trouble later on down the line when yeah. he found a material that was not so good. Yeah, but I'll get into that. A bit. <clears throat> one of the things that this illustrates, I was talking to Anna actually about this this morning. I started listening to a podcast with Mike Rowe. Oh, yeah. And it's basically, it's something I'm probably getting the name wrong, but I think it's the name of his podcast is something like Things I Overheard or Things That I've, I've Heard or whatever, or As It Was Told to Me or something like that. And one of the stories he tells is about the guy who developed the Phillips screwdriver Mm. and the Phillips screw. And he came up with this amazing idea, but he could not sell it. Yeah. He couldn't. It took him Mm. two years. He went all over the place. Finally met a salesperson. The salesperson looked at it, said, I'll buy the patent from you. Oh. That guy, whose name is Henry Phillips, is the one who ended up selling it and making a ton of money off of it. Yeah. So in this type of situation, again, you do, again, there's a lot to get into in terms of the character of Richard Davis. Oh yeah. But when you look at him as an engineer, product development engineer, he also could sell what his idea was and was able to do pretty well as a result. Did you watch the video of the first time he shot himself? Yes. (laughs) Yes. It's like watching like a faces of death video where I'm just like, I know he's alive, but I don't feel like I can see it. It's Mm -hmm. really hard to watch. He said something to the effect of if this doesn't work, boy, what did this? If this works, it'll save a thousand lives. If it doesn't, it'll take mine just like it would theirs, or, or something yeah, to that yeah. effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it was, he's really smooth. Uh, Anna, he actually reminded me a, a lot of David Klein, who recovered, mm-hmm. who was the owner of the, the or the Jelly Belly guy. Yeah, kind of really created something cool, but then also kind of was addicted to the fame a little bit. Yeah, and then you know they become sort of a caricature uh, at the same time. But um, I I don't know. I thought it was an interesting story. Uh, Just like, you know, there were some detractors, obviously, in this documentary, it sounds like his ex-wives and things like that. Whenever you see take that with a grain of salt, but ex-wives were interviewed. It's like, oh, that means they're going to say some not nice things. I know. Yeah. But I mean, I really thought it was interesting. You got to hand it to this guy for taking such a massive leap. I mean, it really takes guts to be like on the forefront of really any innovation but like this specifically um where like error uh, like like trial and error in a product design like error means like somebody dies yeah. right yeah. yeah and so it's just super high stakes and the fact that um an officer died because of a material redesign on this product like that's going to stay with him forever mm-hmm. so i don't know i just thought it's something that we don't talk about a lot when it comes to design work, but there's an ethical component, I think, and a lot of personal sacrifice that kind of comes along with pioneering something that if not done perfectly, could have a very dramatic consequence. Oh, yeah. And we really see that here. Um, you know, it's safety gear. Uh, obviously the benefits have far outweighed the negative side still. Um, 
you know, you think about how many designers and engineers probably carry so much pressure, <laughs> I like when designing critical products. And yeah. it's not something that I really thought about before, but like, you know, safety systems, chemicals, anything like that. Like there's probably a lot of lost sleep that occurs um, around that. And I think that's worth acknowledging. You oh, know? yeah. Like, like the first time a plane takes off. You know, like well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, they describe this Richard Davis as a narcissist. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's sort of a necessary driver that allows people to kind of take that risk, um, knowing that your product is literally the barrier between life and death in the line of fire. And what if it fails? You know, mm -hmm. so maybe there's like a level of hubris that you have to have when you're putting this out there. But anyway, it's it's commendable. And all of the designers out there who do this stuff every day, like. That's awesome. You guys are amazing. Um, I wanted to talk about this Xylon redesign a little bit because the Xylon Bulletproof Vests were a big problem mm -hmm. and not just for Second Chance. So when it comes to Second Chance, in 2018, Davis gave up about $1.2 million in assets and had to pay another $125,000 in fines to, to the United States. The new vests actually became uh, defective and lost their ballistic capability when they were exposed to heat and humidity. Now, by 2001, Davis knew that these Xylon body armor uh, vests were degrading and what he at, at what he described as a, quote, disappointing rate. Now, he was given six million dollars from Toyoba, which is the manufacturer of Xylon fiber to fix this degradation problem. But instead, Second Chance pocketed the money and Davis and his other owners began meeting with various investment bankers to try and sell the company. So and try to instead of fixing the problem, you know, they were just like, yeah. uh, you know, we'll keep it and run. And uh, that just sucks. Now the sale <laughs> effort stopped after Forrest. Uh, <laughs> that just sucks. <laughs> well, it, it does, it does. It's like they saw the problem so much earlier, had the opportunity to fix it. I think that's where that hubris that Anna was talking about. He's like, you know what? <clears throat> I've got this figured out. I know what I'm doing yeah. here. They're going to give me all this money to make it better. I know how to make it better. It'll be fine. So I'm going to take what I can out of this. No, but his way to make it better was sell it. No. Sell I, the problem. Yeah. But he didn't take that money and invest in the development like he oh. was supposed to. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, so then the sale, all efforts to sell the company were called off after the Pennsylvania police officer was shot through a Xylon vest and mm -hmm. died in June 20, uh, 2003, which, you know, that's two years after they knew about the problem. Second Chance then filed bankruptcy in 20, 2004 and was liquidated. Now, more than 50% of used vests could not stop bullets the way that they were, you know, advertised to. That's just crazy. Half of them out there didn't work. And it was found out all because of a whistleblower. This guy, Aaron Westrick, uh, PhD, who was a former employee of Second Chance. And I mean, we talk about whistleblowers all the time and their mm -hmm. importance. I mean, talk about having, talk about a burden on designer. Imagine mm -hmm. like finding out that your yeah. new design on a bulletproof vest is flawed mm -hmm. to the point where half of them are bad if they're in any heat. Now, talking about how it affected a lot of people, Toyoba, the manufacturer of Xylon, agreed to pay $66 million in fines, and the U.S. has recovered more than $132 million from 18 different corporations that all participated in the sale as body armor. So it was a far-reaching problem. Mm. And he still was able to sell his company for like $40 million. Really? Yeah. Even so, what the brand like? Even after yeah. they declared bankruptcy, so yeah. what did they restructure? Well, they still had the old designs. Oh yeah, with I the guess. nylon, the reinforced, the weave, mm -hmm. the nylon weave, whatever it was that that was initially yeah, used. The Kevlar. Yeah. yeah. So that still worked. So he was still able to sell the company. Now he did face some huge fines from the U from the U.S. government. Yeah. But now his son is actually running a body armor company as well. Really? So maybe this guy can sleep at night. I, yeah. <laughs> you like? I, you know, know. I mean, you know. People make mistakes and they can try and uh, make it right. I guess, yes. Yeah. Well, it was a horrible thing he did. Real and big and one. again, yeah. Mm -hmm. Real big one. All right. Our next most popular story this week. The UAE bans flying of recreational drones after fatal attack. The United Arab Emirates has banned drones. The move comes after a fatal drone attack on an oil facility and major airport in the country. Drone hobbyists and other operators of light electric sports aircraft face, quote, legal liabilities if caught flying the objects, according to the AP. Last week, a drone and missile strike in Abu Dhabi blew up several fuel tankers and killed three people. 
The UAE said unofficial terrorist group, the Houthis, targeted the country with bomb-laden drones and cruise and ballistic missiles. The country inter intercepted some of the projectiles, but obviously not all of them. Anna, this is a terrible story when it comes to the potential dangers with retrofit drones. Yeah, although it's weird to me that we're using the word recreational drones and referring to the impacts of this ruling on hobbyists and stuff like this is a terrorist attack. Right. Um, and the UAE already has stricter laws on things like drone ownership, mm -hmm. which prior to this, you had to register even a hobby drone with authorities, which is so outside of what we do here. That's hard to even imagine that. But mm -hmm. um, but likewise, gun ownership is pretty well regulated in the UAE. You have to apply with the Ministry of Interior to own mm -hmm. a gun. Well, to, for a permit. And then there's only one place that you can buy firearms in the whole country. Oh, wow. um, so I guess. <laughs> I wonder what would happen in a place like America if drones were being utilized for nefarious purposes like this. Like here in the UAE seems to be like, like disable them. Yeah. And, and, and so they can, I guess, see a drone and know that they can disable it immediately. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but in the U S where we struggle to agree on how guns should be regulated, I'm curious what we would see if this case were to play out here um, in the U.S., you know, they'd say, like, don't punish the hobbyists for the bad actors or whatever. Um, and I don't know. I don't know that we would regulate this in the same way, which is interesting to think about, like, the ramifications here. Um, obviously, this is pure speculation, but to just immediately lock down all drones, like, mm -hmm. that would never happen. No, no I agree. No. Uh, and Jeff, but there have been some efforts, and I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, where do you stand in terms of, I mean... I feel like this is an, a scenario where no matter what kind of regulation was in place, <laughs> a bad actor is going to find a way. Yeah. And I think that's what you do have to be all careful. And I don't blame the UAE for taking the, having the response that they did. I, I get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People died here. It was a horrible, horrible situation, but you can't regulate, legislate evil people. And that's mm -hmm. what this was. This was a politically motivated attack. This was a terrorist attack. And mm -hmm. you can't do much. To do. They're going to find another way. Okay. Yeah. If it's not drones, it's something else. And the reason that that would bother me a little bit to take that type of drastic action is the individuals developing drone technology for medical supply delivery, for infrastructure surveillance, for a lot of the other useful, pro primarily need necessary applications for drones are potentially set aside as well. Mm -hmm. Because even though you're only looking at the drone hobbyists and the people who do it for fun, those are the people in 10 years that are executing these drones for these types of other very useful applications. So it's one of those situations where you don't want to throw out the technology because of the terrorist, yeah. essentially. Yeah. It, I mean, it reminds me of any sort of response when there's a terrorist attack. It's just, how was it done? Shut everything down and then work forward from there. Um, and honestly, it is going to be trickier as we see more and more objects kind of flying going forward. Uh, and this is something that has been addressed by the Department of Homeland Security, but it doesn't sound like they want to regulate drones so much as they really want to double down on efforts on counter drone technology. Mm -hmm. So last July, the DHS published an article about the importance of this counter technology. So far, like the, in, the incidents that we've seen have been relatively harmless. You know, like uh, while they've diverted some planes, Drones can carry potentially dangerous payloads, smuggle contraband, and conduct illicit surveillance. Um, and those are things that they've already caught them doing. Like they downed planes. They've landed in the White House lawn, I believe. Mm -hmm. Like, so they've gotten close, even yeah. though they were supposed mistakes. Now, the DHS Science and Technology Directorate has been testing various commercial and government systems against realistic threats to better understand how the system systems work and how effective they are. And so... This seems like a suitable response to me where it's like, OK, this is going to be a thing. Obviously, like any new technology, it could be used for evil purposes. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out how in the event we can prevent it. And while they don't give a lot of details in what these technologies are, you know, we've seen things where what was it? The uh, the drone jammer, which was like a gun yeah. that just kind of set out like a pulse that killed the communication. Well, we've, we've seen like the electric nets, essentially, yeah. mm -hmm. that, that prevent them from communicating. We've even seen the guns with nets on them yeah. to try to capture the drones, yeah. stuff like that. So there's some unique <laughs> stuff out there. Um, and I think as you see 
the operators and the ability for the drones to get past this technology, you're going to also see the technology to detect them ramp up as well. Yeah. So it'll be an interesting competing dynamic there, mm-hmm. which I do think is necessary because I do think there's a lot of positive applications that can come from these types of um, unmanned vehicles. That mm-hmm. was the one thing in the article that I found kind of interesting was that they said all drones are banned except if you need it for film work. Like, I saw that too. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. Like, if you're in the movie business, you're fine. Right. But uh, yeah, everything else we assume is evil. Um, <laughs> you know, was, and I would okay. assume the ones that they used here had some sort of camera on it so they could see where they were oh, yeah. dropping down. So. Yeah, true. And it, I'm also interested in like the sophistication of it because, yeah. I mean, there are little quadcopters with GoPros on them that people use to take, you know, shots of their house. And then there are very sophisticated drones that are built for military uh, purposes. Right. It sounds like these, excuse me, <clears throat> were pretty basic because they, they did drop. And if you're looking at an oil refinery, it probably doesn't need a ton to no, really create a close. major explosion. Yeah. No, it's, uh, I mean, I'm interested to see how we move forward with it. Um, and I mean, maybe it's just as simple as if it's in the air, it needs to be trackable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like those drone that, guns like i feel like reading comic books and watching like superhero stuff when i was a kid i sort of underestimated overestimated i guess the number of like nets that would be used to catch to the book. Yeah. space right? garbage oh, yeah, space yeah. Garbage yeah. Net. yeah. And stuff in the ocean maybe i don't know Not catching yeah. a lot of stuff in nets i like that the net deploying gun is essentially like the t-shirt shooter that yeah. you see at like basketball games where it's just like, what are they trying to plug it with like a, you know, an extra large t-shirt? No, that's actually a very sophisticated counter UAS technology. <laughs> it's like, ah, it looks like a Nerf gun with a fishing net. I know. Sorry. And the, the fact that that one thing is called jammer <laughs> makes me think of like oh, yeah. a Nerf gun for sure. Oh yeah. All right. Our next most popular story this week, Ford's new desert racing rock crawling Bronco. Ford recently introduced the Bronco Raptor, a new SUV based on desert racing trucks and part of the Built Wild brand. The Raptor is 9.0 inches wider than the standard four-door Bronco. It sits 4.8 inches higher off the ground. It has a seven... Oh, it has really tall tires. I'm pretty sure it's 37 inches. Yeah, but I deleted that three. It has seven-inch tall tires. It is... That would be amazing. Unimpre- <laughs> yeah. Seven-inch tires going through the desert. Getting off over boulders. Uh, it can move across sand dunes at, quote, highway speeds, crawl over rocks, and is the most powerful street-legal Bronco ever. The company will start taking orders in March, which I found interesting because they also said, ah, the majority of them are actually going to go to existing reservation holders. But, hey, if you want to get in line and give us a little bit of money, right. why not? The Bronco Raptor will start at $70,000 and be available in the summer of 2022. Anna, if anything, it's a cool looking car. It is so cool. Um, But I don't know. It kind of speaks to the story kind of speaks to some of the like knotted issues that are facing automakers, I guess. Like what you said now, interested buyers can place orders beginning in March, but they're already sold. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. Unfortunately, there's like a lot of cool tech coming out right now that automakers are having to move forward slowly on because they lack the ability to fulfill demand. Mm -hmm. So even as companies like Ford and GM are making these big dramatic announcements right now, like GM announcing the company's largest U.S. investment in history, comprising $7 billion, new factories, upgrades, all this stuff. Beneath the surface of all this, they are still struggling big time with like parts shortages. Mm -hmm. So nowadays we just can't get as excited about these new product announcements because it's not like the old days where they could run like a three shift plant till kingdom come and fulfill as much demand as they want. Like, like Ford also like that. Uh, I, I don't know if we talked about it on the podcast before, but like Ford is creating this truck called, I think the Maverick. It's like a oh, low yeah. entry yep. point, low price pickup. And it was so popular. It starts at like 20 grand or something mm-hmm. that they just said a couple weeks, maybe last I think week, this week. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, um, that they have to stop taking orders for it. They haven't even started production on it yet. Right. Um, that's not good. I mean, like, like <laughs> things look yes. great for Ford, like on the surface, they're pushing out all these cool new products. But honestly, it's kind of a worst case scenario, worst case scenario for them that they're forced into these limited runs on these really cool products. Like, I guess the only bright side that I can see is like, 
maybe building demand on the scarcity of these products now and just cross your fingers and hope that people will wait, but mm -hmm. they might not wait. So. I mean, that's, that's the culture right now. It's all about exclusivity. Maybe that's what they're doing. You know, I mean, it's kind of like the test model, too, where it's just like, you want one? Great. We'll get it to you in three years. I guess. I mean, that's what yeah. I, I, who knows how long it's going to take to get, you know, to get all these out. So, Jeff, see, when I saw the photos of this with outdoors, I figured, wow, it's cool. All the doors can come off. I mean, maybe it just doesn't have doors because of shortages. <laughs> no doors. <laughs> yeah. Cut down. We're going to give you some chips. Seven no inch doors. wheels, no yeah. doors. <laughs> yeah. Seven inch wheels. This vehicle is why we need to fix this chip shortage. This thing is amazing. Yeah. Anything that has what they call a goat mode, which yep. is go over all terrain. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about net guns out of a comic book. Like that's what Batman has. He yeah. has goat mode. So this thing is incredible. I mean, the fastest Bronco, like street legal Bronco or straight street legal vehicle of its type out there. I mean, it's that's awesome. This is why we need to get more chips going, which we're going to talk about very shortly. The one thing I thought was interesting, too, with this is it comes at a time when automakers are talking about electric vehicles and fuel mileage. If you had to guess, mm -hmm. because I don't think they put anything out about the miles per gallon on this, uh, the, the Bronco Raptor. Mm -hmm. What would you guess the, the average fuel economy is? For the Mile, Raptor? Yeah, for miles per MPG. I'm going to say maybe 20? 15? 20. Yeah. According to, because I couldn't find anything, I looked on a Bronco like enthusiast page and the guy was saying, yeah, historically it said I can get up to 17. We're seeing about 12. Oh. So <laughs> it's a lot of fun and it is amazing. Yeah. But yeah, highway it, speeds through the desert and then you can't get back. <laughs> yeah. It's don't kinda, go too far. Yeah. I think it is gutsy on Ford's part to yeah. basically respond to the okay, the market's interested in this, but this does buck a lot of trends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In terms well, of what people are going for. I mean, we saw when we saw the Bronco came come back, it had an incredible response. People yeah. were excited. And it's kind of interesting for them to sort of take this, you know, uh this angle with the Bronco compared to what we see with like the Hummer, where the Hummer went like uh went electric. You know, yeah. where it's just like, no, we're going to make the Bronco just more, more, more Bronco. badass. More yeah. Bronco. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it's like, uh, you take your Hummer electric and we're just going to go race in the desert, but not far, not far. Yeah. The other thing I want to say is I did talk to Nolan about this. Nolan put this uh, video together, yeah. did a great job writing and up doing the research. He does need to practice his like Sunday, Sunday, Sunday type voice when oh, he yeah. does these and oh, goes okay. over the features. Yep. Mm -hmm. He was kind of talking about it like it was, you know, a moped or something. So yeah. needs to... No one need to work on that. They got to be 37 inch tires. Exactly. Mm. You got a moped voice is what Jeff just said. That's what Kinda, Jeff's, that, yeah. those are Jeff's words. Yeah. I was just. Yeah, that's no, just his. Uh, I've said this to his face. He knows. <laughs> oh, he this knows. is just He's gonna Jeff's come shade to anybody in their 20s or younger. Yeah. Just like, you don't know the world. Hey, look, just because he was born <laughs> after I graduated high school, that has nothing to do with uh, my trying to mentor him and. Help him to be better Mentor. at his job. It is hard to hear somebody else talk about their infancy in your formidable years. You know, like, just like, what were you doing back then? I was in college. I was an infant and uh, <laughs> nursing. Like, that's good to know. That's good to know. No, but uh, Nolan, Nolan Bilestein, he's crushing it lately. He's got a couple of stories in the top five this week. Yep. All right. Our most popular story this week. Semiconductor factory jobs restored after mass layoffs. In late 2019, microchip technology slashed its workforce in Colorado. The company cut some 300 jobs at a Colorado Springs factory as part of a broader restructuring strategy. It was the last of a once thriving local semiconductor industry, but there's been a change of plans. Supply chain problems caused a huge shortage of semiconductors worldwide. Breaking news there, guys. It forced manufacturers and policymakers to take a new look at producing chips in the U.S. after watching the industry mostly go overseas. As a result, Microchip not only brought back workers, but added new hires. Now, with 700 employees at the facility, the company recently announced plans to invest $40 million in the plant and add another 50 to 75 jobs, which would restore it to its pre-layoff uh, pre levels. And... Anna, what I liked is that it seems more like a long-term play. It does. It's clearly like a multi-step approach. 
um, ramping up over time. And hopefully this slower approach means that these jobs are going to be secure for a long time Mm -hmm. Um, and not a moment too soon, obviously, as we learned recently from uh, some reported government data, chip factories are down to five days of inventory uh, compared to 40 days in 2019. Um, And we're seeing not just the backlog, but also a huge impending need. With electric cars, obviously, consumer electronics are not slowing down at any time. So in these kind of markets, though, we've often seen like really knee jerk activity um, on the part of businesses who are just looking to cash in. And as we cover often in the podcast, sometimes this doesn't work out too well. Right. Because when you ramp up dramatically, there are big risks that you're going to overshoot. And the results of that, as we've seen. Um, are abandoned plants, broken promises, wasted tax incentives, uh, lost jobs. So you love to see an organization kind of take this more methodical, slow approach. They've been adding jobs over the last 18 months kind of slowly, and now they're ready to to ramp up some more. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jeff, that was my initial reaction. What took you so long? Because it seems like you had the capabilities more so than anybody else struggling with this shortage. But- I also it and I also thought like well it kind of seems like a like a money grab you know like how long are these people going to come back then you see an investment like 40 million dollars in the plants and I get it that people talk about maybe that's not that much in the grand scheme of like capabilities but it seems promising. Well, it's a it's a more deliberate pace. You yeah. know, we've covered a lot of other semiconductor manufacturers who are talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in developing a brand new plant, thousands of jobs. And to uh, play the Vic Vinegar to Anna's Hugh Honey, Always Sunny in Philadelphia reference Hugh there. Honey. Okay. Wow, I I'll thought take that the was negative. Something. I'll take the negative side of this. Alex mm. appreciated this uh, <laughs> reference. What I would be concerned about here is, yes, microchip technology is taking a more deliberate approach. These other companies, they're putting a lot of money into something. And what concerns me is the potential to this to be a more dramatic roller coaster ride for the semiconductor sector than it might need to be. Mm. I know we want to get out there. We want to get more stuff done. We want to get more things made here, closer, yeah. get all that. They're not using fewer chips in cars or consumer electronics or even appliances. However, if we do this massive upscale throughout the entire industry, at some point, somebody's going to go, you know what? We could make this cheaper someplace else now. And is it going to be another huge nosedive then 10 years down the line? And all those things that you referenced there about empty factories, people out of work, all Mm -hmm. of that. So while President Biden is pledging like $52 billion in support of a domestic semiconductor production strategy, I also want to know that there's going to be something after that. Yeah. Okay, once at some point we're going to emerge from this, you know, long winter that is the COVID impact on everything, what then? I want to make sure that there's some things in place, kind of what Microchip did here in terms of taking a slow and steady approach as opposed to let's ramp up and go nuts and then not being ready for the potential fallout down the line. That would be my concern with a lot of these other headlines that we've been covering. Well, and we see it it's all cyclical in business, right? It's like a seven to 10 year cycle where, I mean, you're right. It would be nice to have more protections in place to kind of keep things manufactured in the U.S. and not just in 10 years when all of a sudden the pandemic is like, man, I remember. I feel like that was trouble, but I don't have a strong recollection. Because that is what happened to the U.S. automakers. Yeah. When we went through that recession, 2008, 2009, They were used to different demands, different product demands, different consumer demands, different levels of that. They were making too many cars. Yeah. And then they were selling them to rental car companies and other places, fleets, and they weren't making any money on these vehicles. Mm -hmm. That's why they got in so much trouble. Their cars were lasting longer. People weren't buying as many. And it just got them into this really difficult cycle that was tough to break and took a long time to break. Mm -hmm. Now they're reaping some of the benefits. It'll be interesting to see what the automakers do. Once things get back to normal, are they going to go back to pre-production levels that weren't always the most efficient or profitable? Or are they going to sort of try to keep this almost mandated just in time type of approach? Mm -hmm. Fewer vehicles, higher margins. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Well, we've kind of seen seen just in time kind of go away a little bit as people are talking about having more inventory, uh, you know, so they could be they can kind of make it through some of these disruptions uh, going forward. Well, it's just in time because it has to be. It's I, no yeah. longer a strategy. Mm, I yeah. agree. I think that this is a temporary hiccup that was pandemic related. I don't think that that's going to change. I guess I'm curious, Jeff, if you think that any of the reshoring that's happening um, is safe. I mean, 
if, it, you know, from your yeah. position, it sounds like you're concerned about like whatever swings there might be. Obviously, of course, there's going to be cheaper places to produce literally everything. Sure. Um, but we found a lot of companies are moving things back for a lot of different reasons. Security, um, sometimes cost. China's not the the uh, lowest cost yeah. option anymore. Um, you know, quality issues like that. So um, I think that there is something to be said about reshoring and just kind of crossing our fingers that we can do it effectively here. Um, obviously, you're looking at these companies are looking at the numbers, and if they can't do it, you know. I think reshoring is a little bit different than building a brand new factory. When you're looking at reshoring, granted, they are bringing jobs over, but it's the pace feels very different than when you're looking at a handful of these big semiconductor companies doing very expensive, huge builds, making big promises on not a hundred jobs, but like two thousand jobs. Mm -hmm. That feels very different to me. I want it to be sustainable. I want that to work out. I'm just concerned that it's a short term fix. Mm -hmm. So how far out from the pandemic do you think we'll get, if you think it's only a short-term thing in terms of having higher inventory levels, how far out from the pandemic do you think we'll get before that goes back to? I don't know, but I know that like just in time and lean took like a lot of flack yeah. during the pandemic, yeah. but the, there's a lot of reasons companies do it. And cost is a big one. I mean, mm -hmm. for, for companies to hold on to inventory, um, supplies, MRO, all that stuff that we've been going away from that for years because it's very expensive cost center for them to have all that. So um, it would be a big change for companies to completely go away from that. I don't mm -hmm. think that that's, you know, I could see people trying to build in a little bit of fat there mm -hmm. that maybe that we were getting a little bit too lean. I don't know. And maybe this was a lesson in that, well, but I don't think that just in time goes away. I really don't. And those, those strategies aren't just about the number of pieces of product in your inventory. It's mm -hmm. also about visibility and understanding things further down the supply exactly, chain. Exactly, exactly. So those parts of those strategies should never go away and you think mm -hmm. would become more important. Yeah, I just, I've heard a lot of people saying that they're going to hold on to larger inventory kind of indefinitely. But I mean, again, again, it stands to reason that, you know, once people start feeling comfortable, I mean, they're saying that now. And it's expensive. Yeah. And also, um, you know, if you're a publicly traded company and you're, you got a ton of cash tied up in inventory. You're going to have to explain. I don't know. It's, I think people say it now. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people, things that were said in the heat of the pandemic. And a lot of it has to do with reshoring supply chain stuff, yeah. um, inventory, things like that, things that they will do differently now. I think that that will be a short memory on that. Some of that stuff. I'd but. agree. All right. Well, let's move on to our next segment, In Case You Missed It. In Case You Missed It, we talk about some of the stories that maybe weren't as popular online, but stand to make a big impact on the industry going forward. I'm not really sure how having a sponsor for a podcast goes, so I'm going to say In Case You Missed It is brought to you by Oil Eater. If you're interested in trying a free sample of Oil Eater, visit in.com backslash Oil Eater or click the link below. Oil Eater. It's a cleaner and a heavy-duty degreaser. All right. In case you missed some of that grease. Yeah. I, f I felt good about that. Guys. Apply some that was well oil done, David. Yeah, yeah, good work. Yeah. All right. All right. Anna, what is your in case you missed it this week? All right. So my in case you missed it is about Unilever, the consumer uh, goods company. Um, they just announced that they're laying off 1,500 staff as part of a company-wide restructuring. And Unilever makes like uh, tons of stuff, food, personal care products, um, cleaning products. They make Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Uh, so the proposed changes mean that senior management jobs will be cut by about 15%, junior manage management roles by 5%. Um, the company employs 149,000 people globally, but the changes won't affect factory teams, mm -hmm. Unilever said. And I thought this was an interesting story because we've been talking more and more about the leverage that factory workers have right now, um, especially in consumer goods products like packaged food. Mm -hmm. You've seen workers and unions go to battle with these big companies and win. And so it was interesting to see in this case, Unilever, which produces products that were very pandemic friendly, like ice cream, personal care, cleaning products, again, ice cream. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm doing my part. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> that they're working to restructure without leaning on factory personnel. Um, and according to Unilever, 81% uh, of its 400 brands are top two in their market, which is crazy. Wow. But if you look at the numbers, their sales have actually been pretty steady um, and they didn't experience any kind of spike as you might expect during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And it appears that they're so well balanced that while they gained some in home products and food products, um, they lost money in commercial products like food service because all these restaurants were closed, right? 
Um, so the company says that the cuts are about allowing them to be more responsive to consumer trends. But Unilever and its peers have kind of a history of cutting costs um, to hit profit targets. They're all public and um, I don't know. I guess I was just glad to see that it wasn't production being impacted as it right. often is when we see these cuts. So that was um, my, in case you missed it, I was just like, well, I guess, I don't know. For once it wasn't the factory. For guys. once it wasn't the factory workers, man. Like, uh, I yeah. know I hate to, like, I'm not like, like, uh, I don't know, celebrating anyone's job cut, but you know. No, but as, as soon as I read this headline and I started reading it, I, I was just waiting to see like, okay, 15,000, they all have to be like, I, I figured managers on the shop floor, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Jeff, what were your thoughts on uh, Unilever letting go of 1,500 people? No, it is interesting in terms of where they identified these folks to make these cuts. Obviously, it'd be kind of interesting to know a little bit deeper dive in terms of was like areas like, excuse me, <clears throat> supply chain protected more, logistics, distribution, where those folks maybe looked at differently, even though they're managers. Mm -hmm. I also thought a little bit of our very first story we talked about. Now you've got potentially with this reorganization, managers coming into places where they've got more people. Um, and how that could impact potentially, you know, the culture and structure of an organization like this yeah. that is very focused on quality. As you said, they're very proud of the fact that almost all of their brands are in the top two in their market segment. Mm -hmm. So it's when you do these reorganizations, it is kind of interesting to see how things pan out over time. I mean, that's a huge shakeup. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's still it's only what, five percent of the workforce. But it's I mean, it's a lot of people. That's fifteen hundred people. That's uh, I mean, it's going to change the culture somewhat. If anything, the remaining people that, you know, the remaining ninety five percent that made it. But it was like whew, it was brutal. You know, that's <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a bloodbath. Yeah. Um, all right. Jeff, what is your in case you missed it this week? <laughs> so I was initially going to go. We did a couple stories this week talking about cybersecurity. We did one talking about how they're targeting the grid more heavily. Yep, yep. We did another one talking about a regulatory body that's still trying to get board members involved to help address some of these cybersecurity concerns. But then I had to go back to an interview that I did. Um, over time, you know, if you had to think about some of the more interesting people that you've talked to, I mean, we've had a chance to talk to a number of CEOs, people who have really interesting jobs. I was thinking, you know, I, I did get a chance to interview Dean Kamen. That was oh, kind of yeah. cool. Yeah, that's that awesome. a long time ago mm -hmm. during the pandemic. I love that guy's perm. <laughs> and the jeans. He's got great hair. The jeans. Yeah. Uh, um, over the pandemic, I was actually interviewed for a podcast based out of Northern Ireland, which is kind of unique to, to share perspectives on U.S. manufacturing and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I've never done an interview with a guy who had a bird on his shoulder the entire time. Whoa. Yeah. So for this latest episode of Security Breach, we talked to Johnny Young. He has taken on a persona of Johnny Upgrade. Mm -hmm. And he is an extremely interesting guy. Just Johnny to hear Upgrade. talk about cybersecurity. He basically came from a place of when he was a teenager, he was in a lot of trouble mm -hmm. for doing something I'd never heard of called phone freaking where basically they figured out a way to have calls coming from a different number, but you could make it from your home phone number. Oh. So he was calling all these different places, wasn't getting charged for long distance, which was a big deal Whoa, you know, at the time. a long distance yeah. scam. Um, but it was like an FBI investigated crime that he was into, and he realized I could have gotten into a lot of trouble. And as he matured into his career, which spanned 35 years working for IBM and some other aerospace uh, military defense suppliers, he started looking at it from the other side. Mm -hmm. and doing things more from the white hat perspective in terms of protecting all these assets. So in this interview, uh, Security Breach, the headline is hackers are lazy, scammers are misfits. Um, he just talks about a lot of his experiences in terms of preventing early phishing and um, 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 ransomware attacks, things like that. Mm. Everything from people like the pizza man coming into the facility and you'd have to make sure he wasn't walking out with laptops yeah. to try to steal personal information. Talking about just simple things like passwords yeah. that we've talked about to, to protect all this data. So he's got a very interesting perspective, talks about a lot of different stuff that really isn't that crazy, but you need to do. Basic yeah. stuff, right? And yeah. it comes from his uh, his time on the job. So, and he did the whole interview basically with his parrot Scarlet on his shoulder. Yeah. And he's really embraced this persona of Johnny Upgrade. He's got the black skull cap and the dark glasses and stuff. So. He's trying to, uh, you know, he presents sort of the anti-hacker uh, hmm. persona. Yeah. But it's, a, it's a fun interview, and he does talk about a lot of interesting stuff. And that is John with a capital E, all one word, yeah. upgrade. And yeah. when I was watching it, it took me a while because I thought that bird was fake. <laughs> and then the bird moved. I'm like, my goodness, that is talented. Yeah. And just a very domesticated bird. Um, no, I've... Uh, 
all the cybersecurity stuff is very interesting because as we kind of dip more and more into this in the industrial setting, yeah. you realize that there are still so many vulnerabilities out there. Yeah. Um, no, that's uh, so is this going to be like a, a series with uh because this was a two parter, right? Everybody? Yeah. So we will have two episodes with Johnny up here. The next one, he talks about basically hackers being um, no good bastards. Um, basically, they're <laughs> just bad people. And he talks about that. The other interesting thing he brought up, though, is all the jobs that are now being created because cybersecurity is so vitally important in not just the industrial sector, but hmm. infrastructure, yeah. medical, all of that. Um, he's anticipating literally like 100,000 jobs being created just by the need for more cybersecurity expertise. Hmm. Well, I like this series because really my understanding of cybersecurity was the movie Hackers. Oof, that's and a bit that, dated. See, but I mean, that's, you know, they're, movie, they're doing the phone freaking where they're like, yeah, you know, making, yeah. yeah. So it's a, I had an immediate reference. No. <laughs> Hackers or sneakers? Which one was better? I mean... Sneakers is a better film, but when I saw Hackers, I was just like, oh, these are all my people. I get it. They're all weirdos, and <laughs> yeah. they all hate authority. I it's really the, found them relatable. That's, that's the, the young Angelina Jolie, right? She's yep. in that one? Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> one too many, dude. David is, one short, too many. is short-circuiting. Let's. <laughs> all right. My in case you missed, this, missed it this week mm-hmm. is uh, a <laughs> flying car becomes airworthy. Now, while we're talking about problems with more projectiles in the air, a flying car just got certified to fly. The air car is built by Kleinvision, a company based in Slovakia. In June 2021, the flying car completed its first intercity flight, flying about 50 miles. It only takes about three minutes to go from car to plane, or plane to car, either way, the entire transition, and it's incredible. Now, with more than 70 hours of test flights, as well as more than 200 takeoffs and landings, it was recently certified as airworthy by the local Civil Aviation Authority. Now, everything that this company wants to do looks realistic, and the transformation is cool. We've seen a lot of these uh, flying cars, and when they transform, uh, you know, it's really hard to hide the fact that it's still a plane, after it folds up. And this one doesn't do a great job of hiding it either. You know, they say it looks like a sports car, but if you're looking at it really straight on, <laughs> if you were to add any other it angle. It has a DeLorean feel to it. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's a really cool looking plane. I really, the people behind it are the ones that did uh, the Aeromobile 1 and 2. So they got a, a lot of cool people behind it. They have like 100,000 hours into the design aspect of it. It's really cool looking. And everything that they have design-wise that they're, their uh, their ambitions are towards look doable. But then they mention at the bottom of their website hmm. that they're going to work on the amphibious version. Ooh. And it's like, so I get it. You want a car plane, but you also want it to land on water. Have there been any successful <laughs> car land water transition vehicles? Uh, there, was, there was a James Bond movie where they successfully yeah, but, did it in the movie. So yeah. I think that it can so be yes, done. yes, obviously. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know that like Alice Proof. Chalmers in the 70s made like a six wheeled little UTV that could go in the water, but then universally sucked other than being mm-hmm. cool looking. Just it's so it's so difficult. I mean, it's probably easier to make it transform from going from plane to car than it is from like boat to car. Just so dumb. I don't get it. Like there's already planes. <laughs> How do you really feel? Uh, it, dumb is what I said. Um they're like pl- small planes already exist. They already have wheels. They already have, I don't know, just like, so is the design like, like thrust just being put into like trying to make it look like a car? No. Well, I think, I mean, the biggest part is that, you know, what uh, you can be like a mid range commuter and fly land somewhere, transition to a car. And I mean, to, for lack of a better term, get that last mile. You just fold up the wings. You just fold up the wings in less than three minutes. And it's no problem. Never doing okay, that. Okay, so it's certified as airworthy. Yes. Is it street legal as well as a car? It didn't say whether or not it's street legal, but yeah, I mean, it has to have either at least some uh, because after it landed the test flight at the uh, at the airport, he drove it into town. So because oh, it's so that big fin on the back, it looks like an old Plymouth. I mean, that is it's like a Roadrunner. I mean, that thing is it is cool looking. I kind of true. It's, it. and, uh, so you would dr- if you were coming to work, you would drive to the airport. <laughs> fly to here. Where could I fly to? Because it's yeah. only got like, what is it, like a 70 mile range or something? Fly to the but, nearest airport to here, which is the original airport that you took off from. So and then I could fly to like Appleton. No, <laughs> yeah. not even. No, well, it's, uh, so they had, man, I can't remember the, uh, the company. What is, uh, 
there's a company that I interviewed. Uh, what's DJ's dad's company name? Do you remember? Okay, we went and interviewed them. And the owner was really cool because he lived in Madison. Uh, he had a small plane and he could have a company that was, you know, pretty far north of Madison. And he would just take off at the airport, land near, uh, nearby the uh, uh, office, but still had to like walk in or he had a bike or he would get picked up. I mean, maybe something like this for him gets him to the office as well. I mean, we're not talking like we're selling. Thousands I think it's of a cool first step. Yeah. I think it's the most viable looking first step that we've seen. Because yeah. we've seen a number of people try this. Um, I don't have, know. I think you have. can be optimistic here. Yeah. Well, it's. I mean, uh, how many do you want, though, Anna? It's not really if you like it or not. How many do you want? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One, one how many car seats can you fit in it? Uh, that will determine one whether I can in use the two -seater, it. Two seater, three in the three seat, nor the four seater. <laughs> um, not sure how many you get in the uh, amphibious version, but um, it also can uh, land autonomously. So. Oh, um, then the, nothing could go wrong there. Well, part of these flying cars is, you know, we've talked about whether or not you need to be a certified pilot. And uh, and if you're David, you don't. And No, you don't, because it's just like you're flying a big quadcopter. It's all the same. <laughs> but uh, this kind of tries to take a little bit of that guessing out of the equation. It does look a little more solid, though. Yeah. It's like mm -hmm. 2,200 pounds. I mean, it, it looks more substantial. Yeah. No, it's... Uh, I'm on board. I'll get one. <laughs> there we go. There I'm we placing go. the order. Oh, right. It's great because a reservation is only like 20 bucks. No, <laughs> they just need to boost those numbers. All right. Like company card. Let's move on to our final thoughts this week. Uh, Anna, what's your final thought? Uh, so it's been one of those weeks where you have to check the 10 day forecast to decide which day to get gas. Mm. And today was that day for me. And I was still absolutely miserable. So that's what season we're in right now in Wisconsin. Yeah, it was. I mean, snow was actually melting today. I know it wasn't that warm though at the gas station. There's like a wind whipping through there. You have to take off your gloves or you start on fire. Like just <laughs> what not. A, you put the gas in the car. I know, but if you have like a bunch of stuff on and you get a spark, that's how you start a fire. I mean, you can't what, wear, are you smoking? How are you sparking? Yeah. Guys, don't you know about this? No. You're not supposed if if you have like static electricity, yeah. so if you're like wearing a bunch of clothes, they say that more fires are started by women at gas tanks because they are more likely to keep their gloves on or to get back into their vehicle during uh, pumping gas because they get cold. Really? Look it up. Is that real? Or is that like a daytime radio stat? I don't know. I actually don't remember where I heard it. It could be like <laughs> an internet stat. <laughs> yeah. Because I just like, I mean, so like, what are you... Might like have made taking it up. your jack off, jacket off, had everything off, like... Uh, no, but I, I like would not... Plus like a if you... hazmat suit on when you get out of the car. Plus... If you get gasoline on your gloves, do you want that to happen? Do I you do. wear your gloves? Oh, I kinda no. like I love the smell of gasoline. Oh my god. No. <laughs> A little too much. Yeah. This is the wrong room no, for this but I guess, conversation. Uh, I guess that I've pumped gas in gloves, but I don't like make a point to do it one way or the other out of fear yeah. that I'm going to burst into flames. Hmm. Not well, you might want static electricity for my gloves. A know. healthy, a healthy amount of respect for static electricity, guys. We'll, we'll have to get you those strips that you put over your feet that ground you at all times. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's the only way. It's the only way. That's right. Uh, be safe out there, people. Be yep, safe out there. Yep. All right. Uh, uh, we got a comment from Nolan, who happens to be watching the podcast live. Uh, I'm never take. I've never taken gloves off when pumping gas. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, but he never. He doesn't say whether or not he's ever pumped gas. <laughs> and that's, that's a, a fair that's, concern to raise. That's mm -hmm. a risk, Nolan. If you, I mean, just. Well, I mean, these kids these days are just risk takers. You know, they still have that <laughs> Superman complex. <laughs> oh man. Um. All right. My final thought this week is that uh, we recently, you know. The podcast goes out on a lot of different platforms. You know, we talk about how you can listen to it on Amazon. Just say, hey, Alexa, play the Today in Manufacturing podcast, and it'll fire the most recent one. But as part of that, we go through one main service that kind of sends it out to all the different platforms, whether it's Apple, Overcast, Google Podcasts, whatever. And it only recently came to our attention that we might be having some issues with the Apple platform for the podcast. So I just want to say that while we try and keep up on every platform that we're on, we don't necessarily know if something's going wrong. So if you ever have an issue with mm -hmm. whatever platform you choose to use, uh, view us on, please let us know because hopefully that wasn't happening on Apple for a long time. But uh, if you continue having that error, please let us know. And then 
we'll likely send an email to them that they won't answer, but at least we'll know. <laughs> that at least they'll know. <laughs> then we'll blast them on the podcast. Yeah, That's right. we're going to take down Apple with our words. That's right. We're going to force them to pump gas with gloves on <laughs> as a punishment. <laughs> All right. Jeff, I am chomping at the bit to know the answer to the story, uh, question this week. Well, before we get to that, mm. just so you know, I mean, Anna's in one place about scheduling out when she pumps gas because it's so cold. I'm going ice fishing this weekend. Yeah. Nice. I'm leaning into it. That yeah. is so, bananas, but okay. Where are you going fishing? Eagle River. Nice. Like Looking he's driving four hours north of here to do it where it's even colder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's how we do it. Just to get more cold. I mean, just don't get so drunk that you freeze to death on the ice. Thanks. Yeah. That is, that's actually, no, you just screwed up the safety question for no oh, here. All right. Oh. No. No. <laughs> actually, the question we had last week, I did not get a correct answer from anybody who submitted stuff. Uh, there was, however, one individual within this room who did have the correct answer to what is the biggest safety hazard to children in the home? And it's not bathrooms. What is the biggest safety hazard? We do, do appreciate Kyle, Joe, Chris. Thanks for uh, sending in your answers, but they were not correct. The biggest safety hazard for children in the home. Mm hmm. Chemicals, cleaners, oh. poison, stuff like that. Yeah, that seems really simple now that you say that. So we did have some things that were sort of in the area, but not exact. Mm -hmm. So no winners this week. So what did people like? What was sort of in the? Well, I, I, we had one person that talked or we had a couple actually that talked about like swallowing, choking. Oh, so mm -hmm. sort of, yeah. but not quite. I don't want to dwell on this too much. No, let's right, not right, dwell right, on yeah, it because yeah. it's just all my fears in yeah. real time. Yeah. It's all bad Alex, stuff. Alex, yeah. you're ready to be a dad. There you go. No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> No. Whoa, what? <laughs> no. <laughs> and it told producer Alex that he's ready to be a dad. And his response was, getting on it. <laughs> I don't know if you're ready. Anyway, yeah. anyway. I don't know. Jeff. I don't know how to segue from that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe um, wait. Well, let's get on this yeah. next question, Jeff. All right. Is this brought by brought to them by Oil Eater as well? Yes. Sure. Oil Eater. Uh, go to IEN.com backslash Oil Eater for your free sample today, Jeff. Here we go. How do you store... Oily rags. Oh, oh, you did not. I did. Okay. Mm. Here are your options. This is A, B, or C. A, thoroughly dry in a commercial dryer. B, in an open, well-ventilated metal container. Or C, in a covered metal container. Oh. So A, thoroughly dry in a commercial dryer. B, in an open, well-ventilated metal container. Or C, in a covered metal container. Let us know for one of those sweet custom limited edition Today Manufacturing Podcast t-shirts. I feel like we're giving away a lot of shirts this week. I hope so. <laughs> because uh, one of those answers is pretty hilarious. <laughs> but, uh, and, and for those inter interested in safety, um, if anyone can find any data to back up my contention that you can <laughs> wear gloves while getting gas, please send it to me. Copy right. Jeff. Copy David. <laughs> Very good. All right, before we get out of here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. Actually, you know what? Before we do the closing, I just got to say, like, it's been a year, and it's been awesome. I really enjoy doing this podcast with yeah, you guys. Yeah, it's fun. So, For uh, sure. Yeah, no, great work, you guys. And thanks to our producers, Alex and Eric. Uh, they do a great job. Alex Shanahan and Eric Sorensen, who are continuing to clap Still for clapping. a long amount of time. They've been and, drinking for two hours. <laughs> right? I'm glad we can do the podcast so you could drink during it. All right. Now. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast so we can do another year of it. And to email the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, Anna, or David at IEN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can also subscribe to our daily and weekly newsletters and make sure you get the podcast in your inbox first. All right. For Jeff and Anna, I'm David Manti, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast.